been at the club. Fantastic. Incredible. What, my dear fellow? Absolutely fantastic. Oh, well, what's happened? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. A ghost? <laughs> brandy, that's what I need, brandy. Brandy, brandy. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who struck you? Well, you said it yourself. It was a ghost, and without any previous warning at all, he hit me in the eye. Yeah, I... Wait a minute, yes, sir. I think you'd better have another. Well, uh... mm. yeah. uh, Thank you. And now I'll begin again. Who struck you? Upon my words, Holmes, it was a ghost. A ghost. Huh? Uh, do you have a headache, Watson? It may seem humorous to you, but I mean, look, let me tell you from the beginning. Yes, please do, but, but start right at the beginning. Right, uh, well, I was on my way back from the club. You see, it was about um, 8 o'clock. And I got into Spender Street, and I was just opposite that little tobacconist. You know, makes that Yes, yes, kill. I know, yes. Go on, Watson. What, what did you do then? Well, I saw a man in front of me suddenly clutch his chest. He was walking towards you? How'd you know? Well, I mean, you said he staggered and clutched his chest. You must have been... Uh... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's logical. Anyway... Yeah. Yes, well, anyway, I rushed up to him in order to help him, you see, and he, he's still able to mumble something about it. Oh, uh, he had a heart, and he lived in 19 Hooper Street, mm -hmm. and uh, would I help him get there? But know? there were no other pedestrians? No, no, the street was completely deserted. Good, go on. Well, then, um, his landlady let us in, and he was unconscious by that time, so I carried him up to his room, and I laid him out in his bed, and Holmes, he was dead. Now, look here, Holmes, he was absolutely, completely, and utterly dead. I couldn't make a mistake about a thing like that. No, 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 of course you couldn't, old man, no, no. Go on, then, uh, what happened next? Well, uh, then I told the land, uh, the landlady rather said to me that, that she, she'd call the authorities, you see, and I left my name with her just in case, you know, they'd want me. And uh, 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 then, well, well, I thought it'd be rather more delicate if I left, you see. I mean, he must have relations. Yes, 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 it's quite right, quite right, Watson. The most delicate situation. Yes. Uh, so what was the man's name? Uh, uh, Higgins. Albert Higgins. Uh-huh, I see. And what did you do after you left the house? Well, you see, it had been a bit of an effort, you know, carrying him up like that, so I got down the stairs and yeah. popped across the road into a pub yeah. and, and had a pint. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And, and then I started off ba ba back to the flat, you see. Well, I just turned the corner into Spender Street and there was... Uh, uh, there was uh, Higgins, Albert Higgins? Uh, yeah, he just faced to face with me. There he was, large as life. We stood looking at each other for a minute, then he lashed out and hit me in the eye. And then, then, then really, Holmes, he vanished. Vanished? Yes, he into the blue. Well, he ran away. Well, the street was rather ill-lit, you know, and it took me a minute or two to pull myself together. <laughs> and, and then I don't know whether he ran away or not, but, but he vanished. Well, that's uh, most unusual. Most? Uh, did you speak to this uh, ghost? Well, I, I may have said, uh, good gracious Higgins, or by Jove Higgins, or even uh, good, good heavens Higgins. Oh, yeah, it's perfectly natural, Watson. Uh, uh, describe Higgins to me. Well, he's 50-ish. Uh, Sandy-haired, medium bill. But he, he said all you observed, and no characteristics. Well, now, really, Holmes, when I had the chance of examining him on the bed, the most obvious characteristic was he was dead. Yes, yes, but how was he dressed? Uh, green tweed suit. What? Just, just wearing a green tweed suit? He must be wearing something more than that in this weather. Oh, oh no, 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 he had a, a big floppy hat and a long overcoat. Ah. Oh, oh, and something else. Yes, I did notice something else. He limped. Aha. And was he carrying a cane? Mm, no, no cane. What is it? Anything else, Watson? Think hard. Mm, um, uh, oh, yes, yes, I remember something now. What? Yes, the, 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 the second time I saw him, he was carrying a package. But the first time, he didn't have one. Ah, uh, now this is curious. Very curious. Where are you going, Holmes? Not me. We. Oh, I'm in no condition to leave the house. And a morsel of raw beef will immeasurably improve your appearance. And then what? Then we shall do our best to track down the belligerent ghost of Albert Higgins. Fascinating idea, don't you think? Well, the whole thing's been most unnerving. You know, I mean, he knocks the wind out of the chap. Yes, oh, please. really, no. <laughs> There's also a rather flamboyant character by the wide, rakish brim. I see he was an artist, too. Well, he hasn't painted very much recently. Notice the specks of paint underneath the brim here. They're not house paint, but canvas oils. Here, yeah, what's this? Who are you, Jensen? What are you doing in poor Albert's room? Oh, good evening, Mrs. Blake. You remember me, Dr. Watson? Uh, you're the bloke who bought poor Albert in? Yes, yes. Who's your gentleman friend? Ah, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mrs. Maggie Blake, the landlady. 
Pleased to meet you, I'm sure, Mr. Holmes. Oh, poor old Albert. He was proper fond of life, Albert was. He wouldn't have popped off if he'd had his way. Oh, few of us would, madam. I was around at the local having me good night pint. And grieving for poor old Albert. He would have wanted a proper send-off with a pint of mild and bitter Albert would. No doubt he would, madam. The body, I see, has been removed by the authorities. Oh, poor old Albert on a slab. Oh, oh dear, dear. Uh, have, you, have you notified his next of kin, uh, Mrs. Blake? No. He had none. He was all alone. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, where was Mr. Higgins employed, madam? At the Pembroke Museum, right around the corner in Spender Street. It's a picture museum. Albert was a day watchman. Uh, a day watchman, you say? Well, what were his working hours? Nine in the morning till nine in the evening. Punctual as a clock, Albert was. Never late a minute. Poor Albert. He always came back from the museum then, at a few minutes after nine every evening. Aye, to make his supper. He was a proper good cook, Albert was. Excuse my saying so, madam, but aren't you mistaken? Surely it's a little after eight when Mr. Higgins finished work. Because it was only a little after eight when I picked him up this evening and brought him here. Oh, no, Doctor. It was just after nine. I marked the time because I was waiting for Albert to come back. He'd asked me to get him a cut of beef. He always came back just after nine. He'll never eat that beef now. Poor Albert won't. Oh, it you in the eye? Hmm? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just, uh, just bumped into a door. Oh. You shouldn't get familiar with the door, if you know what I mean. Well, really, that Yes, I, I think we've found out all we can for the time being, Watson. Mm. Thank you, madam. We shan't intrude on your grief any further. Poor old Albert. It really is most embarrassing about this I, Holmes. Did you hear? She inferred. It's a terrible situation. And she's wrong about the time. It was only a little after eight. And it's only a few minutes walk to spend the street. <laughs> Time is a curious dimension, Watson. Habit and a preconceived notion can so easily reverse the hands of a clock. And yet the clock is still in perfect working order. Where are we, where are we going? To view the mortal remains of poor old Albert Higgins. <laughs> uh, well, there he is, Mr. Holmes. Nice and peaceful, I gave. Poor chap. Uh. See anything, Holmes? Nothing that I haven't already deduced, except that I drew an erroneous conclusion from his hat. He has painted recently, but indoors with his hat off. There are still traces of paint quite fresh under his fingernails. What does that mean? I haven't the faintest idea. Mm. Well, you gents aren't the only ones interested in this dearly departed. Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yards looked him over too. Oh, indeed. Oh, he's still here if you'd like to talk to him. Well, that should be very informative for one or the other, or both of us. I can't understand it, Holmes. I'm absolutely sure this is the man who punched me. I'm positive. But also the one who had the heart attack? Yes, I'm sure of it. One and the same. <laughs> well, he's punched his last punch. Well, he probably is there punching him. Full of holes with pitchforks. <laughs> yes, well, I think we've seen and heard enough. Would you like to take us to Inspector Straight now, please? Hello, Inspector. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I'm surprised to see you here. Now, this is one case you can't make anything queer out of. Oh, then why, my dear Inspector Lestrade, are you here? Well, when they brought him in, somebody recognized him as Pound Note Albert Higgins. I come along to check their identification. We like to keep a track of our old pals, you know. What was he in prison for? Counterfeiting. He made the best pound note you ever saw. Yes, he was a real artist. Straight, there's no doubt as to the cause of death, is there? Oh, sorry, Holmes. Heart failure, no foul play. I understand you were with him in his last moments. Yes, I was with him on the street when he had the attack and I took him home. There's nothing you could do, I suppose. Nothing. He was dead before I had a chance to do anything. Mm. By the way, what time was he brought in? Oh, let me see now. It would be about, um... Ah, yes, here we are. Quarter to ten. Higgins' landlady notified Constable Smithers at half-past nine. 
Smithers had them remove the body in a matter of minutes. Inspector, are you sure it was half past nine and not half past eight? No, half past nine is right here in Smithers' report. Why? Oh, I... Well, I... No, it's nothing, nothing at all. You're quite sure, Lestrade, there's nothing more to this than a simple case of natural causes. Ah, no, there's no mystery at all. No mystery, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, what happened to your eye, Dr. Watson? Hmm? Oh, I, I uh, bumped into a door. A door? <laughs> oh, well, that's a new one anyway. Was it a pretty door? Oh, really, Lestrade. <laughs> that's all right, Watson. I won't tell a soul. <laughs> Well, really, this is insufferable, Holmes. Nobody believes me. Well, why did you tell them the truth? What, that I was punched by a ghost? Yes, yes, I see what you mean. We may have to take on this case anyway, if only to protect your honor and reputation. Why, well, it's intolerable, Holmes. Absolutely intolerable. Mm. Anything wrong? No, nothing, nothing. Of course not, every night. Oh, you're sure you're not brooding over last night's affair, are you? Of course I'm not. Don't be so ridiculous. Oh, come on, out with it, man. Well, I... No, there's nothing to come out with. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on, Watson, there's something on your mind. Well, I... Gosh, you'd never believe it. Nobody'd believe it. Well? Well, I met Albert Higgins in Spender Street again, tonight. And he punched you again? He pulled my nose! Really? Very, very interesting, Watson. My dear Watson, calm yourself. Look here, Holmes, this whole Higgins affair has gone too far. First of all, last night and now tonight. Calm yourself, Watson, and relate. Everything hangs on this second encounter. Well, it occurred just it had last night. I was on my way back from the club and I'd reached Spender Street. It was a few minutes ago, as a matter of fact, just after nine o'clock. I'd stayed rather later in the club than usual. There was a chap from Afghanistan. They was awfully interesting. Uh, yes, yes, Watson, get on with his story. Well. I was rather preoccupied, as you know. This affair has cut me up, rather, and uh, although I may not say. Yeah, anyway, I, I was going, walking along, I suddenly looked up and there was the pedestrian, a man a few feet from me. Walking towards you? Oh, yes. Of course, I didn't recognize him straight away for uh, you-know-who. Anyway, I sidestepped him past and he sidestepped to let me pass and then we sort of zigzagged about a bit, you know what it is on the street, and ended up by bumping into each other. Now that's when you recognized Albert Higgins? But it was Higgins! I couldn't be mistaken! Good heavens, man, I know him like my own brother! Uh, dressed as he was last night? Exactly! And what did he do then? Well, as I told you, then he put out his hand and he... Well, yes, we'll go into that. And then he was gone. Vanished. Capital, Watson. Capital. Everything begins to fall into place. Now, there's one more question. Was he carrying a package? Well, um, mm, yeah, yes, he was, just like last time. I say, Holmes, do you, um, do you believe, uh, What? The supernatural? Uh, ghosts, do you mean? <laughs> Sounds silly, I know, but, um, Higgins did die of a heart attack. There was no foul play. No foul play? Why, the whole affair reeks of foul play. I can tell you, Watson, I haven't been idle today. Do you know that the Pembroke Museum is showing a collection of paintings on loan from the Italian government, and that included amongst those paintings is Leonardo da Vinci's Moonlight Madonna? Well, I did read something about it in the paper. What's that got to do with Albert Higgins? Well, we must now pay a visit to the good inspector and inform him that if the ghost of Albert Higgins hadn't struck you in the eye... And pulled my nose. And pulled your nose. I would never have suspected the Moonlight Madonna would be stolen from the museum. What? Well, it's quite obvious, isn't it? Well, of course. I see. Oh, thank you. Well, we'll soon know, Mr. Holmes. 
But if the picture's still hanging in its place and we've dragged the curator out of bed to check on it, well, false alarms like this don't exactly help the Yard's reputation, you know. And what about my reputation, Inspector? When I say a man died a little after eight, he died a little after eight and not a little after nine. And when I say these ghosts punched me in the eye half an hour later, hang it, he punched me in the eye. Oh, we all have our off days, Dr. Watson. To err uh, is human, as the poets say. And furthermore, if I tell you that I bumped into this chap's ghost again tonight, you didn't... didn't tell me about any second meeting. Oh. Oh, didn't I? Well, nothing. Nothing. An hallucination. That's what you had, Dr. Watson. Yes, it's, um, psychological. No, it's a thing in crime today, psychology. I've been studying it, you know. You astonish me, Inspector. Oh, we're not as backwards as you think, Holmes. No, we like to keep abreast of the times. Though I don't mind admitting I don't think the psychology's got much of a future. Oh, come in. Ah, Hawkins, you saw the curator? Oh, yes, sir. I'll call him, Mr. Bentham, as you instructed, sir. He was quite excited when I told him this picture called the Moonlight Madonna had been stolen. And? And so we rushed around the corner to the museum. And? Well, sir, the picture was there, hanging in its proper place. Good night, sir. Well, there you are, Holmes. As I said to Dr. Watson, to err uh, is human. Can I give you gentlemen a lift anywhere? Thank you, Inspector. Oh, I think it might be a good idea if we called at the Pembroke Museum on our way. But you heard what Hawkins said. The picture was hanging in its proper place. My dear Lestrade. Hawkins' statement merely proves that what he and the curator saw was not the Moonlight Madonna at all. Merely an excellent forgery. <laughs> What's he talking about? Art, ghosts, my black eye, and psychology. Remarkable, remarkable. Only a microscopic examination of the brush stroke shows it any different from Da Vinci's work. Of course, if you still have any doubts, you could, a chemical analysis of the paint mixtures will prove them to be of modern manufacture. No, no, no. You've quite convinced me, Mr. Holmes. An analysis is necessary. Dear me, dear me, this is catastrophic. Mm. A rather delicate situation, eh? Delicate? <laughs> the Italian government will hold the British government responsible. But the painting is an Italian national treasure. And a theft could easily affect a pending treaty between the two nations. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, you must find the original before the Italians learn the painting's been stolen. The British government will hold me responsible. And the Yard will hold me responsible. Oh, the most prices of the lot, too. Yes, naturally. Well, we know who stole the painting and substituted a forgery, Higgins. All we've got to do now is find out where he hid it. Hmm. What time did you leave the museum, Mr. Benson? Well, uh, a few minutes before nine, Higgins was still on duty. You're uh, quite sure it was Higgins? I'm certain, Mr. Holmes. I chatted with him for a few moments, and well, I couldn't have mistaken his voice. And the night watchman relieved him at nine. Well, you heard him say that, Mr. Holmes, and that he had a package with him when he left. The night watchman swears uphill and down dale it was Higgins, all right. Well, the matter seems to resolve itself very nicely, doesn't it? Dr. Watson was punched by Higgins a few minutes after nine. The night watchman saw him leave at nine. And you spoke to him a few minutes before nine. Look, Holmes, why don't you and Dr. Watson go home and have a good night's rest? From now on, it's nothing but plain, ordinary, simple police work. Nothing you could use a magnifying glass on. Ah, true. True, Inspector. Well, good evening, gentlemen. Yes, well, good night, gentlemen. <laughs> What do we do now? Interesting affair, eh, Watson? 
Look, I don't care what anybody says. It was after eight when Higgins punched me. Well, has it occurred to you that if Higgins didn't punch you, who had the heart attack? Well, now, look here, Holmes, I'm... Oh, confounded, for all I know, it was Higgins who punched me and his ghost had the heart attack. <laughs> Come on, Watson. Tell me what we're breaking into. Shh, whisper. But I am whispering. Oh, oh, quiet, Watson. Look here, we broke into the rear of the museum because if so, Holmes, really I don't know what's going to happen to us. Uh, here, hold this. What? Oh. Yes, well, then there must be a bit of a vandal in us all. Oh, what are you doing? This is wanton destruction. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I forbid you to. I didn't know this side of your character, Holmes. I'm shocked. Ah, just as I thought. Look, what's Good heavens, but more like Madonna. Yes, ingenious, isn't it? And yet, what could be simpler than to attach it to the back of an old another painting? How on earth did you work there? Well, I just asked myself where I would hide a stolen canvas. Uh -huh. Holmes, have you gone mad? No, 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 we're just await events. I don't think we should have to wait very long. Hmm. Holmes, Dr. Watson, what's the meaning of this? Watson, I believe you've already met Mr. Benson in his capacity as curator of the Pembroke Museum. Allow me to present him to you now as the picture thief. Charmed, Dr. Watson. Oh, delighted. I... What is this? So you discovered my little hiding place, Mr. Holmes. I'm curious. How did you know it was I and not the late lamented Higgins? Yes, I believe Dr. Watson stole it from the first. If Higgins died at a little after eight, it must have been someone else who struck him a little after nine. But it was Higgins who punched me home. Don't know, Watson. It was a limp, a wide, floppy hat, and an exceedingly long overcoat that punched you, seen in a dimly lit street. A psychological misidentification, as the good inspector would call it. The night watchman was also a victim of the same illusion. And um, what about the landlady? How much did you have to pay her to set back the time of death by an hour, Mr. Bentham? Oh, not much, Mr. Holmes. How did you know it was me? Dr. Watson and the night watchman both identified the nine o'clock Higgins visually at a distance. Only you pretended to have spoken to him. This meant that either you were lying or Dr. Watson was punched in the eye by a ghost. I believe the simple explanation. You almost make me feel transparent, Mr. Holmes. To anyone who viewed the facts objectively, you were. It's a pity that one crime has to lead to another. Yes, and I think it's a great pity, Holmes, that you broke that vase. Oh, yes, yes. Well, it's uh, only an imitation. Nonsense, you can't tell me that that sort of work like this is an imitation. Perhaps the piece is be. Well done, Watson. Well done. You know, Holmes, you didn't have to invite him here to catch us. You put us in rather an awkward position. Oh, my dear fellow, I have sublime confidence in your ability to extricate us from any predicament in which my rations may place us. Uh, might I suggest that you now fetch the good inspector? Yes, yeah, here you are. Yeah. Excuse me. I say, Holmes, Bentham punched me in the eye. Who was it tweaked my nose? Well, my dear old chap, it was absolutely imperative that I make certain that the limp, the hat and the coat were really capable of fooling you. You? Yes, I regret to say I not only tweaked your nose, but I also pulled your leg. Oh! What?
Is there an accident at the house? Please, miss, please give me the key so I can unlock you. Be sensible, Doreen. This nonsense is getting you nowhere. I demand to be arrested. Now, just what's going on here? This young lady, Doctor. Oh, hello, Miss Strong. Oh, good day, Wilkins. She's a, a suffragette. Suffragette. We demand that women be given the right to vote. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. She and some other suffer suffragettes invaded the home of the Honourable Chauncey Pimpleton and started a demonstration. Pimpleton? Why, he's a member of Parliament, lives just round the corner. That's him, sir. We were getting them to move on, and this young lady broke loose and chained herself here, sir. But why did you do it, miss? Because we want equal rights for women. That's why. Yes, but I don't see how chaining yourself to iron railings is going to obtain for you. You wouldn't understand. You're a man. She probably wants to wear trousers, too. <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted to, I would. Mr. Holmes, can you get her loose? She slipped the key of the handcuffs down her... We're waiting for a hacksaw now, sir. That's right, a hacksaw. Hack me to pieces while you're at it. I'm only a woman. I believe I can help you. I don't want any help. She wants to vote. Now go on home and cook your old man his supper. <laughs> <laughs> now arrest me. I insist upon it. I'll leave her in your hands, if I may, Mr. Holmes. Coward! You'd arrest me if I was a man. Mr. Holmes, may we impose upon you? I somehow have the impression you already have. Won't you come up? Ourselves. This is my fiance, Miss Doreen Meredith. First secretary to give the women the vote. I'm delighted to meet you, Miss Meredith. Uh, and I'm Henry Travers, personal secretary to Mr. Pimpleton. Oh, yes, yes. I seem to remember that it was Mr. Pimpleton who uh, led the attack on the suffragette bill in the House the other day when it was defeated. And very, very resoundingly defeated. Yes, that old stuffed shirt. He'll be sorry. I wish you'd get out of this. Give women the vote league, Doreen. It's dangerous. Yes, I can see that it has its inconveniences, Mr. Travers. But I don't really believe that it's dangerous. Would you call bombs dangerous, Mr. Holmes? Good heavens, are they using bombs now? Oh, just a teeny one. Boris and I made it to blow up a lion. My dear young lady, you don't blow up a lion, you shoot it. Uh, who is Boris? An anarchist. An anarchist. He's an old dear who wouldn't hurt a fly. Blowing up lions. Anarchists. Sometimes I don't know where modern England's going. Well, perhaps Miss Meredith might be good enough to indicate that direction for us. Well, it all began at the meeting of the Give the Women the Vote League. Miss Agatha Axton, our president, was presiding. Quiet, ladies, quiet. I call this meeting of the council in order to consider our next step in view of the defeat we suffered last week. <laughs> As you know, the honorable, <laughs> the honorable, gosh, even if he is my cousin. Well, anyway, John C. Pimpleton rallied the anti-women forces in parliament and defeated our bill by the narrow margin of 347 to 1. Boo! Down, 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 We've got to do something, ladies. We're not making enough noise in the world. What would Joan of Arc do? What would Catherine of Russia do? They would attack. They would blow up something. Blow up something? How do you do that? I don't know, but they would do it. Don't bombs blow up things? I think they do. Let's buy a bomb. Where can you buy one? I've never heard of a bomb shop. We could make one. I'll make one. Can you? I don't know. I, I've never tried. I'll get a book. Good. But, um, 
What shall we explode? Let's explode a lion. Wonderful. We'll explode a lion. A very small one, of course. <laughs> well, anyway, I didn't know how to make a bomb. So, uh... So she advertised in the Times. Wanted a person who knows how to make a bomb. Oh, yes, yes. Dr. Watson and I read the advertisement. We tried to decipher it under the impression that it was a code. Never occurred to us for a moment that it meant what it said. Well, anyway, Boris answered it. Yes, that's right. I am the person who makes a bomb. Sit down. Please, it is you who advertised. Yes, it's me. Uh... I'm so glad you answered, Mr. Mr. Turgov, Boris Turgov. Do you really know how to make a bomb, Mr. Turgov? All over the world I have made bombs. Big ones and little ones. Bombs that go and bombs that go. Well, you must understand, we don't want to hurt anyone. We just want to blow up one of the lions in Trafalgar Square. I think a little bomb would do. One that goes... One that goes... Do your bombs make a lot of noise? Not those that go... Oh, I must ask you just another question. It's a matter of principle. Do you believe in the equality of the sexes? Please, I'm an anarchist. All I believe in is nothing. Oh, excuse me. Uh, that sounded funny. Have you the ingredients for the bump, please? Oh, well, uh, I'm afraid you'll think me an awful amateur, but I don't know what ingredients go into a bomb. It's nothing. We will go to the chemist and buy them. Boris made the wrong formula. It was only a small explosion. And so you made another bomb out of a croquet ball. Oh, yes, we went to work on it right away. But where is it? Here. Doreen! Good Lord, get, get it away from her, Holmes. Well, it won't go off unless it's hit very hard. Might I see it, Miss Meredith? Take care, my dear chap. That's no croquet ball, you know. That's precisely what it is, Watson. Just a very ordinary croquet ball with a crest on it. Why, that's Mr. Pimbleton's favorite croquet ball from his garden set. And the crest? The family's. His uncle's the Earl of Clareborough. 
His favorite croquet ball, did you say, Mr. Travers? Does he always use a green one? Always. He, he plays every afternoon at five. He's as regular as a clock. Then if that's his croquet ball, then someone must have... Exactly, Watson. Well, then he'll go and play croquet with a bomb. What time is it now? Hmm? Five o'clock. He only lives just around the corner. If he's as punctual as Mr. Travers says he is. He is. He was standing here when it happened. It was his first swing at it. And that's the first time in the history of Scotland Yard a man's been killed that way. Oh, really, Mr. Strait. Was there anyone else with him at the time? Fortunately, no. Mr. Pimpleton had invented a game where he played alone. He always won that way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you that ball, Holmes, might be another bomb. Oh, well, we'll soon know, won't we, Watson? <laughs> Any other leads, Mr. Strait? Well, he received a delegation here in the garden. Oh, yes, yes, I seem to have heard something about that. Yes, a girl named Doreen Meredith presented him with a suffragette petition. Really? Doreen Meredith? Yeah, a lovely name. Yes, it is rather. Well, Strait, do you believe the ladies blew him up because he defeated their petition in the House? Yeah, let me have a go at this. Well, you know these suffragettes are capable of anything. These wickets aren't in line enough. No, it's not that, Lestrade. Your swing is wrong. Look. But nevertheless, bombing seems a bit drastic, even for suffragettes. Oh, so is this business of their wanting a vote. Well, why not give them a vote? They couldn't do any worse with it than we have. Oh, hello, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Travers, Mr. Pimpleton's private secretary. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Oh, I've already How met you, Mr. Travers. You've already what? Oh, I've already seen Mr. Holmes down from the window. I understand that Mr. Pimpleton was the heir of the old Earl of Claverer. Yes. Tell me, who is next in line for the title? Well, uh, possibly I am. I, I'm a remote cousin of the Earl's. Yes, uh, I understand that you were in the garden with Mr. Pimpleton when the delegation from the suffragette movement called on him. Yes, I was. Interesting. Do you play croquet, Mr. Travers? No, I prefer lawn tennis. Quite so, quite so. But you really ought to try croquet, you know. Under normal circumstances, it's a fascinating and completely harmless game. From the Pimpleton, Holmes suggested a stroll in Hyde Park. I suspected what he hoped to find there. Here in Hyde Park, where vast multitudes of people can gather to hear us under the banner of free speech, I call on the women of England to demand equal rights with men. We cook, we sew, we scrub. Why shouldn't we vote? Throughout the ages, women have been the pawns of men. Men of England, hold your ground. Keep women where they belong, in the kitchen. Women of England, keep out of the kitchen. Give them the vote now, and in five years' time, they'll be running the country. Sir, I ask you, are women slaves? Sir, I ask you, are they capable of voting? I, I know speak English. <laughs> Haven't you got anything better to do, you... you... Here now, don't you talk to me like that. No rioting, please, or I'll have to ask you to move along. I was moving along anyway. I'm very particular whom I speak next to. Ah, free speech. You say something men don't like, they tell you to move on. Well, of course, Miss Meredith, like all prophets, you're ahead of your time. And uh, without honor in your own country. <laughs> oh, Miss Meredith, we'd like to ask you a few questions about Boris Turgoff. Oh, poor Boris. He'll never forgive me for getting him in this fix. He's so gentle, really. It's 
who there? Sherlock Holmes. You want what? I'd like to have a word with you, Mr. Sherlock. This is my good friend, Dr. Watson. I'm told you manufacture bombs, Mr. Turgoff. All kinds. Long fuse, short fuse. Did you make only one bomb for Miss Meredith? Oh, you know of that one. Well? Two bombs I make for her, but one her young man sets off. Accidentally. He says. Do you know where this other bomb blew up? Yes. In Mr. Pimpleton's garden. Not the first time that the Turgov bomb goes off in the wrong place. Can you explain how the bomb became substituted for the croquet ball? No. I do not go inside the house. I wait outside. Then the police come. And when the police come, Turgov goes. Always. Without exception. I see. Uh, Miss Meredith tells me that you were sent it to someone who makes little bags in which to carry bombs. Yes. A friend of mine I have who makes bomb bags. Uh, who is he and where does he live? A Greek named Chen Ten Yong. He lives in Soho, 22 Flower Street. A Greek named Chen Ten Yong? He says he's a Greek. Am I to call him a liar? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Turgoff. Come, Watson. Mr. Turgoff, I wouldn't manufacture any more bombs if I were you. Scotland Yard's looking for you. What? No more bombs? <laughs> what am I to make then? Paper bags filled with air, maybe? <laughs> Paper bags? Now we're home. Well, now a visit to Mr. Chen Ten Young, and then a bit of research at the College of Heralds. College of Heralds? You mean where they keep all the records of the title family? Precisely. This case started with the theory that women would get the vote, and I believe that one day they will. Oh, nonsense. And the solution of the crime lies in the theory. You mean some hidden fact we may have overlooked? Well, uh, some subtle factor, Watson. Like a bomb? <laughs> to give you a sample of Scotland Yard at work. No magnifying glasses, just plain, ordinary police routine. Excuse me, Dr. Watson. Send him in, Wilkins. Very good, sir. Send who in? All the people connected with this bomb business. Miss Axon, would you sit here, please? Miss Meredith, will you sit over there? Mr. Tucker? This, Mr. Holmes, is Miss Doreen Meredith, the young lady who presented the suffragettes' petition to Mr. Pimpleton. We found set up in her kitchen a laboratory. She's been making bombs. I do not deny it. I told you we were going to blow up a lion. A lion? Oh, come now, Miss Meredith. We were also able to nab her confederate, this man, Boris Turgoff, an anarchist. He makes bombs, too. The Turgoff bomb, it is famous. Well, can send in Chen Ten Young, will you? Very good, sir. Chen Ten Young is a naturalized Greek, born in Brazil of Chinese parents. He makes um, little bags for carrying bombs. Fascinating occupation. Ah, Chen. Tell me, Chen. Did this young lady order a bag from you? Yes, mister. Hmm. Did you make this bag? 
Yes, mister. Five shilling six pence. That is so, but I'm price. I see. Well, there it is, Holmes. There you are. An open and shut case. Miss Meredith killed Pimpleton because he was anti-suffragette. Ingenious, Miss Trade. Really quite ingenious. You know there's only one thing wrong with it. What? Neither Miss Meredith nor Mr. Torgoff are guilty. Oh, I didn't expect you to agree with me. You never have. Well, not always the strain, but uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes. However, in this case, the real murderer killed Pimpleton for one reason, and one reason only. To be next in line to the title of the Earl of Claverer. Well, who is next in line? Look here, Mr. Holmes, you trying to imply that I... Miss Meredith. After it was decided at your suffragette meeting to blow up a lion, who invited you to Mr. Pimpleton's house? Why, uh... Why, Agatha, we had to decide about the lion. Did you carry the bomb? Yes, in the bomb bag. Where? Wait a minute. This gentleman had access to it, too. Together with this lady. What does that mean? It's an intriguing title, Clairborough. First created in 1417, it has an unusual clause in its charter. Once and only once may the title pass to a female, if the female be next in line. That would automatically make her a countess. So far, that hasn't happened in the history of the title, until now. Well, I'm the next male member of the family. It's Agatha, she's older than I am. I refuse to sit here and... Watson. Thank you. You'll notice, Lestrade, that this bag is identical to Miss Meredith's. Chen, who ordered this second bag from you? This woman, mister. Uh-huh. Chen, why didn't you tell me this? You know I ask me, mister. This man, he ask me. And you see, the switch was simple and premeditated, of course. Why, Miss Axton, how could you? Preposterous! Anyway, young man, you had no right to come into my house and get that handbag. It's thieving, and it's against the law. Detain her, Wilkins. Mr. Holmes, what ever made you think of Aunt Agatha? Well, at least I can tell you this much, Mr. Travers. I didn't use a magnifying glass. You see, the true deductive mind knows just when to substitute routine investigation for deduction. Are you going somewhere, Lestrade? Across the room, Mr. Holmes. I have put on my hat. I deduce, therefore, that I am leaving. Routine investigation will reveal the fact, Mr. Holmes, that I have gone to see the Commissioner. I will ask him to do everything in his power to encourage the suffragette movement. We will then no doubt have a woman inspector in this office. And when Boris gets out of jail, Mr. Holmes, I will ask him to make me little bombs. I will then go about London blowing up lions! <laughs> Good day! You know, Holmes, I've been worried about his complexion lately. I think Lestrade needs a rest. Yes, Watson, yes, I'm inclined to agree. <laughs> 